Um, so without further ado, we get to this evening's speaker. Now, I first met Dr. Caitlin Parsons um, a few years ago in Regina, Saskatchewan, of all places. And as soon as I saw her paper on, um, was it, let's see, digital documentation of Icelandic Canadian manuscript heritage, I mean, I, I knew that I was onto a good speaker. And since then, I've seen her present on various topics, all of them with fantastic levels of interest and all of them really on different things, um, which is, is a real treat. And so she seemed an obvious uh, speaker to invite to our seminar series. Um, at the moment, Dr. Parsons um, is a postdoctoral researcher um, who is working on um, the project, the sacred and the profane, comparative studies and the reception and transmission of popular and religious literature in late pre-modern Iceland at the Arnie Magnusson Institute for Icelandic Studies in Reykjavik. Um, and indeed, her doctoral thesis uh, completed at the University of Iceland also focused on similar topics um, with the title uh, Songs for the End of the World, the poetry of Guðmundur Erlundsson of Fairly Sletilith excuse my pronunciation, and you can actually read Dr. Parsons thesis uh, online. Um, we've posted the link in the event page where you booked. But this evening, Caitlin is very eager to tell us about the literary connections between Scotland and Iceland across the North Atlantic in the pre-modern era. So I shall hand over to you, Caitlin. And I'd really like to start the presentation today by thanking the family of the late Dr. Robert Cook, Professor of English at the University of Iceland. He passed away a decade ago in uh, 2011, but his meticulous and groundbreaking work on the poem Einvaldsöldur has been truly, truly invaluable. And many thanks also to Janet Hadley Williams, the founding president of the Sir David Lindsay Society and the many other members of this wonderful society who have generously shared their extensive knowledge of the poet and the literature of the Scottish Renaissance. And it has really been amazing getting to know Sir David Lindsay. Now I'm going to share the screen. So I have some slides here and maybe if something Ian will let me know if something goes wrong here but here you have a map of Iceland as Sir David Lindsay might have known it and um, I'm sure that many audience members will be much more familiar with the name of Sir David Lindsay than any of his counterparts in Iceland um, David Lindsay has a much better Wikipedia page for instance uh, than most Icelandic poets in general. Um, and I'm sorry to say that Guðmundur Ellenson, his Icelandic translator, doesn't even have a Wikipedia page in Icelandic. Um, so my talk today will really be focusing on this quite obscure Icelandic context into which uh, Lindsay's work is translated. Now, despite the title of this talk, Sir David Lindsay did not actually set foot in Iceland. Iceland in the 17th century was not a tourist friendly destination. If you survive the ocean voyage without being shipwrecked, being eaten by sea monsters or captured by pirates on the way, you could engage in fun activities like whaling with your crewmates, dodging sea ice, dodging polar bears, trading illegally with the locals for socks and mittens, drinking some very large quantities of very questionable beverages and feasting on delicacies such as sour fermented butter which by some accounts could be stored up to 20 years without being entirely fatal. Tourist agencies did not yet exist in the 17th century to enthusiastically promote Iceland's image abroad, and the travel literature of the day painted an even more unflattering portrait of the island destination than probably was the case. Visitors are depicted with a perpetually fuming Mount Hecla breathing down their necks as they bask in the freezing polar air. And uh, the island's inhabitants are also hinted to practice witchcraft in addition to the more normal activities of fishing and subsistence farming. 
there were uh, very well documented massacres of foreigners in 1539 and, and 1615. And while these do represent particularly low points in Iceland's very long history as a very tourist and friendly island, it was unusual for those few visitors who did come to remain over the winter months unless absolutely necessary. Winters, winters were dark, they were bitter and they were cold, and there were no towns or even villages in which to seek out entertainment and puffin keychains. Iceland's first tavern inn would not open for nearly 150 years more. But there are other ways of traveling, and Sir David Lindsay came to Iceland through his words. In the beginning of his longest poem, a dialogue between experience and a courtier of the miserable state of the world, here referred to by its short title of the monarchy, he commands his pure book to go hence. It's very unlikely that Lindsay ever imagined how far abroad his pure book would travel, but poets can rarely foresee the future paths of their work. The poem's journey into the world began around 1554, but it didn't reach Icelandic literature until 1658, around 100 years after Lindsay's own death in about 1555. While he was still alive, Lindsay was both a makar, or a royal court poet, and a courtier in the royal household. He was born around 1490, and he became one of the educators of the future King James V of Scotland. Lindsay was a playwright in addition to a, po a poet, and it's in this role that he's best known today. His celebrated play, A Satire of the Three Estates, is a rare instance of a complete surviving pre-modern Scottish play. Lindsay eventually rose to the position of Lord Lyon, King of Arms, and he participated in several major diplomatic missions over his lifetime, most notably to Denmark in 1548. Many years later, after James V's grandson, James VI, was married to Anne of Denmark, which happened in 1589, interest grew in strengthening the cultural ties between Denmark on the one hand and Scotland on the other. And one outcome of this was a Danish translation from 1591 of the collected poems of Sir David Lindsay, co-translated by a young Scottish university student at the University of Copenhagen and a talented but out of work Danish clergyman. And it was a copy of this printed book that we know reached uh, Iceland across the North Atlantic in the 17th century. Reaching Iceland this way via Denmark rather than directly from Scotland, which is geographically much shorter, was fairly typical for the literature of this period, regardless of its origin. The reason for this is political rather than linguistic. Iceland had become a Danish dependency as a legacy of the Kalmar Union, which united the kingdoms of Norway, Denmark and Sweden. The Kalmar Union was finally dissolved in 1523, but Norway, Iceland and the Faroe Islands remained under the control of the Danish crown. A trading monopoly between Iceland and Denmark was officially enacted in 1602, restricting Icelanders from trading with anyone but Danish merchants, except in cases of very extreme need. An emergency clause that was admittedly liberally invoked in the first decade of the 17th century but it was taken quite seriously by the century's end. Had Lindsay wished to visit Iceland during his own lifetime, it certainly would have been feasible, and he wouldn't have needed to go to Copenhagen to get there. English ships sailed regularly to Iceland during the summer months, and although they were increasingly pushed out by ships sent by the Hanseatic League, they continued to be in Icelandic waters for centuries. In 1490, around the time that Lindsay himself was born, King Hans of Denmark and King Henry VII of England signed a treaty permitting the English to freely fish and trade in Iceland, permit, provided they had a permit. And uh, even though this wasn't entirely exclusive, you could also apply for a permit if you were a handsome merchant. It meant there were quite a few ships in uh, English ships in Icelandic waters. And uh, one can imagine that if you were particularly adventurous, you could hitch a ride on one of those fairly easily from Scotland. 
Lindsay uh, himself was at least twice in England on diplomatic missions. So if he had really wanted to go on a literary retreat to Iceland to experience the Saga Islands, he could in theory have done so quite easily. This kind of situation uh, had changed very much from his own lifetime to 1658. Denmark began to grow quite quickly as a colonial power over the course of the 17th century. And eventually Denmark was not only engaged in trading goods, but also in the Icelandic, uh, transatlantic slave trade, which began in the 1670s. And as a Danish dependency, Iceland was increasingly positioned in the role of a money generator for the metropole of Copenhagen. There were very draconian laws imposed on uh, anyone in Iceland who traded illegally with fishermen. And these penalties were invoked harshly, to say the least. There was no, by the end of the century, there was even no exemption if no ship appeared in your uh, designated trading harbor for the year. And it was quite a cause of hardship for the Icelandic people, in addition to being not particularly good for the Icelandic economy because the, uh, the Danish merchants could and were allowed to uh, sell at certain prices and uh, the Icelanders had to sell at certain prices. So it was very restrictive, unfortunately, um, not only for the economy, but also for the literary connections. Um, there were quite a few nations, uh, seafaring nations who were in Icelandic waters during the period. Um, and they, uh, they could potentially, for example, uh, the English and the Basque and the, the Dutch could potentially have been a real source of literary inspiration, but this kind of contact uh, was generally um, discouraged by the uh, trading monopoly. Uh, and I think that it's interesting that uh, over the course of the 17th century, Icelanders are directed to regard Copenhagen as the island's cultural capital, but it's far from the case that Icelandic poets are only interested in what's happened in happening in Copenhagen. And I think it's not entirely surprising that um, this interest in Copenhagen. Uh, so David Lindsay comes to Cop uh, comes to Copenhagen, ascent like 50 years later. His book comes to Copenhagen and is translated. And 50 years approximately after that, his book is translated into Icelandic. Um, it's a question I want to look at this literary translation because it's quite interesting and quite unknown outside of Iceland. Although I think it's a little better known than before. So here we move on to my favorite uh, translator of the 17th century, Guðmundur Ellenton in fact in Slættili, poet and translator. He was quite a character. He was born and raised at Fett in Slættili, in Skagafjörður, which is in the north of Iceland. And this is located around a day's ride from the bishop's residence in Hólar, which I think is quite strategic. In my doctoral thesis, I suggest he was actually a relative of the bishops and that the bishop wanted to have his relatives close at hand in light of the fact that previous bishops had been um, executed for uh, their role in the, uh, the Reformation. And I think it made him somewhat uneasy and he wanted to surround himself by his friends and supporters and relatives. So well, we don't know anything about Guimander Ellenson's heritage except the name of his parents, I suspect that he did have a connection to his wealthy patrons at the bishopric of Holar. So for those of you who are not familiar with Iceland, Iceland is uh, historically divided into a northern diocese, which is fairly small compared to the others, and then a southern diocese, which also covered the west and east of the island. And it was this northern diocese that was the last to convert to Lutheranism officially. Um, it was the site where uh, Grim, uh, Jón Arason, the, the last famous Catholic bishop of Iceland, uh, held out against the, uh, the, Danish, uh, the Danish forces who were, and the Danish king who was attempting to install uh, Lutheranism and at the same time gain control of the properties of the monasteries. And of course, that was probably his main interest was to gain this incredible 
amount of wealth. He was the, the Danish king was in want of money. And uh, and so this was very important for him to come through. But uh, Gwilmandir, uh, let's see, I have a picture here in the next slide of Bishop Jon Arsen of Holar. And this is actually his cope. Um, so he was executed in 1550 with his sons Björn and Ari. And for those who don't know about Icelandic history, um, clerical um, the clerics in Iceland, so there was never a tradition of clerical celibacy. So it's quite normal that he had a large family and um, that two of his sons were supporting him during this uh, ride. But it's also interesting to note that some of Gwimadish Ellenson's patrons in the 17th century were descendants of Jón Arason. So it wasn't that his line was extinct at the uh, end of the Reformation. It continued to hold considerable power in the North, which I think is what made the Bishop, the, uh, the bishop of Hola rather uneasy. Uh, the first dated poem by Gwimund de is from 1615. And this is actually quite relevant in the modern context. It is a poem about how he caught smallpox during a massive epidemic in the 1615 to 1617 and uh, nearly died. The poem is written when he's 19 years old and it is a death hymn, which shows just how close he was. Uh, it was a near death experience. He nearly died of smallpox. Um, and this very much shaped his career, I'd argue, from this point on, he became a very religious poet, and uh, a lot of his work is very much focused on calamity and the end of the world, hence the title of my doctoral thesis, Songs for the End of the World. Um, he was uh, often writing about natural disasters and such uh, phenomenon in the context of the apocalypse, which in his interpretation was quite, quite imminent. And this, I think, fit very well with uh, David Lindsay's interpretation of the world. And I, I would argue it was a major inspiration for choosing this particular piece of poetry from Scotland. His last dated poem is from 1668. It's uh, to his wife. It's a lament for his dead wife of many years. Um, it's quite a beautiful piece, and it's also touchingly the very last piece that we know he ever composed. He died suddenly two years after that. Um, but in addition to composing for his family members, he also had many wealthy patrons, including three generations of bishops at Holar in North Iceland. But here we have a comparison between David Lindsay and Gwimundur Erlinson, a poet and his translator. Um, the Monarchy is, I'd argue, one of the more obscure works by David Lindsay, but it's certainly the one by which he was known during his own lifetime or at the end of his own lifetime. What was his kind of uh, masterpiece in the minds of the generation who followed David Lindsay and the one that people were most familiar with during the 17th century? Although today, as I've mentioned, he's best known as a playwright. The Monarchy is a universal history. It deals with the history of the world not in a modern sense of things that have already happened, but it places the world in the context of temporal history from the last, uh, from the birth of creation of the world all the way into the last judgment. So it's an amazing span of time that includes human history that hasn't happened yet. And this is something that distinguishes it quite a bit from the kind of modern concept of history. Einwald Dollar is a bit different. It only deals with the flood to the present. And as you can see, uh, it's been condensed quite a bit. The monarchy is 6,338 lines. So it's a massive work of uh, Scottish literature. Uh, whereas Einwald Dollar, which is its translation, manages to condense it into 307 eight line stanzas, which is quite the feat considering especially that the lines are very short. Uh, Wim de Allenson, when he was choosing a meter to interpret the monarchy, which has uh, mainly four feet couplet, four foot couplets, but it does change in the meter from section to section, particularly when there's a digression, the, this will be signaled by a change in the meter. Um, in Einwald's Dother, you have unrhymed Fortnilislag from beginning to end. And Fortnilislag is quite an interesting meter for those who do love and uh, 
and uh, thrive in Eric poetry and, and the kind of Viking past. Uh, Forte is like is the uh, meter that was used for Völuspa, the first and probably most famous of the Eric poems, which is again a history of the world in its own way, although it's reported from a seeress to Odin, and she's beginning in the creation of the world and taking him all the way to its, again, ap apocalyptic end and beyond. Um, and it's interesting here, I think this is not a coincidence, because Völuspá was being discovered at exactly this time, 1658, it's around this time that uh, Icelanders are rediscovering these Eric poems and Völuspá and Hávamál. So it's a uh, it's actually a really early example of a poem you can find that seems to be echoing back into the past at the same time as it is uh, actually a translation of a much more modern work. And the way you can see the influence is not least in the framing narratives. He's changed the framing narratives quite a bit to adapt to his audience. Um, there isn't time now because of, because of the delays, uh, unfortunately, to go too much into the, the adaptations he makes to this narrative. But I think the most interesting from a translation and a literary translation perspective is that he actually writes himself in to the poem almost as a translator. Um, he says that he overhears this conversation in the monarchy where you have two speakers. It's a, it's a dialogue between a courtier and experience who is a figure personifying human experience, the past, the present, and the future. And this in the Icelandic translation is condensed so that you have a single speaker who talks about how he has been listening to a conversation. And of course, the, the conversation is the dialogue, but there's only a single speaker in, in Einvaldsöver. And the place where he describes himself listening to this dialogue is, of course, the location of the monarchy. The monarchy takes place in the framing narrative in a park uh, in, into which the courtier has wandered. And the courtier is, of course, uh, Sir David Lindsay. It's kind of portrayed in an autobiographical way, even though he keeps, stays anonymous. He describes enough of his career. You can see that he intends it to be at least semi-autobiographical. Um, but Icelandic poets, as I hope I've conveyed successfully during this uh, this presentation in the 17th century, they did not exactly go wandering out into nature unless they had a death wish. I mean, it's maybe an exaggeration, but uh, 17th century Icelandic poets do not write poetry about how when their minds are troubled, they walk into a park and encounter trees and flowers. This is completely foreign to an Icelandic setting. And he actually solves this difficulty in translating this quite foreign concept of a beautiful park into which you walk and are inspired into a riddle that's at the core of his translation. His translation states that he is listening to a conversation that takes place in a tree and it's in a grove. But when you understand the Icelandic, at the end, he explains that this is actually a riddle and that the grove is actually the mind. It's happening in the mind's eye. It's a play on words, lundur and lund. And there's another play at parts uh, taking place in this uh, amazing translation, which is that the book is the tree. So the tree that he's describing, he's listening to the conversation and he's saying it has beautiful leaves. And of course, here the English and the Icelandic are identical. You can see the book has leaves and the tree has leaves and he's reading the leaves of the book. And he, but you only realize this at the very end of the poem. So it's quite an effective strategy for translation of some fairly foreign concepts and some very foreign uh, nature images within the poem. So in his, um, as anyone who has familiar with David Lindsay's work, it's quite anti-clerical and it might be coming as a surprise that an Icelandic Parson would be particularly enthusiastic about uh, David Lindsay's attacks on the clerics. Um, I found it also quite interesting from a political perspective that he changes the attack in, from an attack on the clergyman in general into a very pointed attack in the clerk in Rome. And he does this by introducing slanderous stories like Pope Joan and such like. And he claims that the Pope is... Uh, 
he, they have this bizarre ritual in which they check his gender. And of course, this is based on material that he can find, but he's added it into the translation as well. So it becomes almost an adaptation to the Icelandic context. Um, now, finally, just to wrap up, I wanted to talk about the modern incarnation of Einwald from 2017, which is a chamber opera by Gwilm de State Gunnarsson who is an Icelandic composer based in Reykjavik. Full disclosure, he's my husband, but I mean, we work together on uh, various projects. He's also the descendant of Guðmundur Ellenson, the translator's sister. So there's a nice connection there. And we were directly uh, inspired by the project staging and representing the Scottish court, uh, which some of you might be familiar with. This was in uh, 2013, there was a full production of uh, staging uh, his play, um, a satire on this, the, the yeah, so this satire, there was a full production and this was actually the first time since uh, 1554 that it had been produced in its entirety. This play can last up from five hours up to nine hours. So it's an incredibly long work. And the concept of doing this uh, was very inspiring from an Icelandic concept because it's also very unusual to produce or perform Icelandic works in their entirety. But this is obviously a work intended for performance. So um, State agreed to this <laughs> crazy project where we took the entire text of Einvaldsöver and it was performed. And it was kind of a fantasy. There's not much information about how these types of texts were performed. So rather than attempting to recreate uh, the original setting, it's a kind of fantasy of what it might have been like in the past. And just to, for by, both for technical reasons and interests, it's been divided into two voices, a male Kvaida Madhid, who is uh, doing the kind of more traditional chanting style of voice, and a female soprano, which uh, Gwim at the State saw as kind of representing the voice of the past. Uh, and it was quite interesting because without knowing it, uh, he often picked out the male parts as being the parts that Gwim and Ellenson had added, and the female parts were uh, generally David Lindsay's own original material. So this wasn't a 100% overlap, but you could see the translation reflected in there that there were two different voices, the voice of the translator who was on freely inserting himself into the text and the voice of the translated text, which is feminine in Gwim and the State's interpretation. It premiered at Slautati Festival in 2017, and the instruments are inspired um, by traditional Icelandic in uh, instruments, but also modern uh, interpretations of the instrument called Gia and a Doraphone. So these are electroacoustic string instruments. It's quite an experimental performance. And it looks like we do have a few minutes left. We have here one of the what he calls Gia. And in the spirit of this being a rather homemade instrument, it's uh, made with a 3D printer. This one was made in the Faroe Islands by uh, Icelandic, I'm sorry, Peruese high school students who have decorated it with their own, own design. He had permission to take this one home, but these are the instruments based on the Icelandic folk traditions. And I know you're all probably very tired and apologies for how long it was delayed due to the issues with the PowerPoint. But I would like to, if possible, end with just two tiny little clips of Einwald Zoder to give you a little taste sample of how both Icelandic sounds and how David Lindsay sounds in Icelandic and how this experimental performance sounds. Stjörnar mán er á stíinn morgun sali Á loft eru skálir í land norðri Húmlogi glansar hesperus fagri So that is Einvaldsóðir, Sir David Lindsay in Iceland. And just thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about this today. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Caitlin, uh, for a really engaging uh, talk. And uh, yes, exactly, join me in a cartoon round of applause. Um, I, I would like to I would like to remind everybody that if you've got questions for Dr. Parsons um, about her presentation, you can pop those in the chat uh, right now. Uh, it's just the, the chat button. Um, if you've used Zoom, I don't know whether you're familiar with this tool, but it's becoming quite common these days. Um, I, I've got a question of my own. Um, I found this idea that um, our translator had felt comfortable to um, liberally adapt, um, um, you know, a piece of work quite interesting. Uh, as a translator of myself, I tend not to add myself um, in, into the plot of things I work on. But I wondered whether you think this is symptomatic of Icelandic literary culture more generally because once we get past the pre-modern towards the modern there's the, the lovely example that comes up quite a bit of the Icelandic translation of Dracula um, which is about 100 years old um, where the Icelandic translator sort of knocked out a bit of a fanfic and it was only within the last few years that it was identified by literary scholars that the Icelandic version of Dracula is very, very different from the original and contains all sorts of extra chapters and characters and the plot is different. Um, is, it, is it the insular location of Iceland which encourages translators to take these liberties? Yeah, it's, it's such a good question. I love the Icelandic translation of Dracula. <laughs> I wish we could get away with doing that today, but unfortunately, as translators, um, people usually do notice if we <laughs> deviate significantly from the source text. Um, so maybe what I wasn't able to convey fully during this was I think he was tailoring it to his patrons. Um, I think he wanted to give them a message they would like. I suspect often we have some evidence in some of the texts that he seems to be writing on demand or that somebody is like, here, take this, it's really good. Um, the fact that, um, and this is something I, I found fascinating, but I couldn't really get into the presentation. Uh, there were some pieces that I think would have been really controversial for an Icelandic audience, um, and particularly for his patrons who he didn't want to offend. And um, Lindsay, like one of the things he talks about in this poem is how the clerics are local clerics are preying on the ordinary people and stealing their livestock and abusing and misusing their kind of command of heaven to, um, you know, steal cows from people in their hour of need. And this disappears from the text entirely. This is not talking at all about local corruption. He's not talking about the Icelandic situation has having been particularly problematic or corrupt it's it's a nice opportunity to attack the pope and preach to the choir so it's a it's a really interesting um uh question like whether this is it is almost like on the, the borderline between adaptation on one hand and translation on the other I guess that leads us really quite neatly into the question that Rosemary Power has, um, and I mean, how long is a piece of string? But Rosemary wonders, um, was Lindsay selected deliberately or, or was it, you know, just chance that his text got to Iceland? And it's a nice compliment to obviously the fact that they were perhaps in the market for something to adapt rather than just translate. Yeah, exactly. And I... I don't know if exactly got this across, but the uh, literary culture of Iceland in the middle of the 17th century, early and middle of 17th century is an incredibly vibrant and people are translating all kinds of material, like everything you can get their hands on, people are interested in, it feels like. There's a there's a Icelandic uh, piece called Scotland Rimur, which is about the Gowrie conspiracy. So, you know, it's talking about the Scottish, you know, the plot you know to kill the king and and um and so people are very interested in what's happening in the world and what's happening in scotland i would argue there was quite an interest in uh what was happening in the neighbor to the south and how stable the political situation was and if they were there was going to be any conflict and these kind of things um i think there was interest in scotland i tried as much as possible to research whether people were looking at Scotland as a kind of destination to exchange uh, deliberately. It's kind of ideas and people and economy. And I did find an example, for example, of, um, 
one guy who did die in Scotland of natural causes. <laughs> he was an Icelandic man who had immigrated there. So there was uh, underground connections uh, for sure. These were all very much um, illegal. It was illegal to trade. It was illegal to have those kind of connections. But I think people were interested in Scotland uh, actively at this point in history. Um, and some uh, very wealthy Icelandic families sent their uh, younger sons to, to England and presumably they also traveled there. So I think people were interested in having more contact with other countries than Denmark and Copenhagen, but it was, it was being very actively restricted, unfortunately, at this time. So I don't know if that exactly answers the question, but I think it's no coincidence that he was selected. Um, uh, yes, as, as Rosemary points out, yes, the, the Icelandic did come from, from the Danish translation. Um, so, I mean, in, in that regard, I guess we can note that, you know, it's no coincidence in that there wasn't much translation going on to Icelandic from any language that's not Danish um, at that time, um, but there's still the offered potential. Um, please don't be shy um, with your questions for Dr. Parsons. Um, we've got one here uh, from uh, Jack Hartley, uh, who asks, is there a modern edition of the text in Icelandic available, Katie, um, or are you considering publishing a bilingual edition? So the, I mentioned at the top, sort of top of the talk that uh, that Robert Cook had done a lot of work on Einwald Zolid and unfortunately before he passed away very untimely for us who were his friends that uh, he had been working on an edition for decades of Einwald Zolid. It's an incredibly complex poem to edit because the the earliest surviving uh, texts of it, like the earliest surviving manuscripts are about 100 years younger than the poem itself. And by that time, it's all over Iceland. I, I should mention this. This is an incredibly popular poem into the 19th century. I mean, into the late 19th century, people on households all over Iceland are reading this and copying it. It's never published. It's not part of the official literary canon, but there are about 80 manuscripts that survive. And so it's quite the job. Um, and unfortunately, there isn't a modern edition of the text, but it was his uh, vision to create it, a uh, bilingual edition. So, so we're hoping and fingers crossed that we do manage to, to finish his job. You know, it's, it's almost there. <laughs> Watch this space in that case. Um, well, I have another question myself, if no one has one, um, which is, is more specifically why um, the, the period between creation and the flood why, why didn't that make it into Einwald's other um, on purpose or, or um, just sort of fell by the editorial wayside? Yeah, so for this one, I think definitely uh, performance. And this is why we wanted to perform it. You can make your audience sit down for two and a half hours on an uncomfortable bench and listen to somebody, you know, in this case, two singers uh, telling you about the history of the world, but there's only a limit. And it's um, it's designed for performance within an evening where there, uh, you have Sir David, like Sir David Lindsay is really, uh, he's not going for an evening performance with it's more than 6,000 6, lines of text. It is quite a work that takes a while to get through. Um, so I think it's just for these kind of thematic, uh, both thematic reasons that it condenses it quite a bit and uh, focuses it. And also just in terms of you can't perform that much material. Um, so that that is, I think it's very pragmatic that he cut that out. Um, kind of like see the Bible for what happened before. This is not, uh, this is kind of universal history that's not Bible history. Um, it's quite entertaining stuff. It's got, you know, Sammy Ramis, the wicked queen killing her husband secretly as she feasts and all this kind of juicy material that's, yeah that everybody wants to hear about on a long, dark winter evening in, in Iceland. Uh, I was going to say, I saw that Rosemary wrote there was plenty of Latin to, to Icelandic, and that's, of course, absolutely right. That was the other main language. But, um, but it was actually encouraged increasingly 
as Denmark's control of Iceland kind of <laughs> the hand of Denmark kind of descended. I don't mean this in a bad way, but um, they were actually, for example, the later Bible translations where they were told, don't follow the original, follow the Danish, which is kind of an interesting <laughs> for a translator, frustrating. And uh, at, yeah, they were they were wanting you to write. Yeah, work from the Danish edition, even though it, you know, it has errors, don't go back to the original Latin. So there was an attempt to kind of control this and make sure it was coming from the official, official source. The best source. Of yes. <laughs> we still have a little time if anyone else has a question for Dr. Parsons, but it is one of those long dark nights so it feels it's been raining in Scotland for about the last two days non-stop but don't think it really got light okay yeah sorry about the the quietness of the chanting um we can try if, if people are interested um we there was definitely an interest because it is my own microphone that it was going through um I can play the other one and we can see if it's Gjörðan í tómi grafskrifteina Yfir sjálfan sig svo látandi Með því þú visti maður dauðlega Þá lífði laus og gólistinn gallri Gjörðu fullna ég gindum þín Og veltir í hvörskin svelli stingum Lifðu á lómjúku, lifðu á dísætu Svo sem að gjörði sardan á palu I really hope that someday I can actually come to Scotland in person and play it for everybody or better yet that we, you know, go to Scotland and perform Einwald's Ode that would be amazing and bring everything very much kind of full circle so that would be perfect it's a long time since the society has been to the north atlantic so perhaps we're overdue a field trip in that <laughs> direction as well um i think i'm going to draw things to a close here so um i would like you all to join me again in uh, thanking dr parsons for her fantastic uh talk uh with the cartoon hands or there is the the party emoji or the heart as well the, the choice is yours um and as you can see in the chat our, our next uh, seminar 16th of december as mentioned dr linda ross and um, please do join us on the 20th of november for our virtual conference featuring speakers such as tanya boltman and graham morton but for now thank you very much to caitlin for your talk uh, we hope to see you in person at a society event at some point, but uh, we're very grateful that you were able to join us this evening and so good to see so many of you. We will see you next time. Thank you and goodbye.